Hey everyone, it's Dr. Andrew Wolf here with Health Ed Solutions, and today's lesson is on respiratory acidosis, and it's part of a series on interpreting ABGs. Don't forget to visit us online at healthedsolutions.com for more free content. Now let's get started. So just a reminder, carbon dioxide or CO2 is a waste product of energy metabolism, and our cells are constantly producing a lot of it. So it's normally excreted through the lungs. So it's brought to the lungs through the bloodstream, and much of it is dissolved in serum. It dissolves a lot more efficiently than oxygen do, does, and then some of it is carried by hemoglobin. So, you know, as the cells produce it, it goes to the bloodstream, the, blood, um, the blood passes by alveoli in the um, pulmonary vascular bed, and the CO2 diffuses in across the alveolar arterial membrane and then it's excreted through the lungs as we breathe so ventilation is critically important so you can see there's several sort of steps in this process it diffuses from the pulmonary vascular bed into the alveoli and then it is exhaled through the lower airway, the upper airway, and then out into the atmosphere. And that's how we excrete CO2. So what happens in hypercapnic respiratory failure is that something interferes with this process of, in, of exhaling and excreting CO2, and we end up with a CO2 that increases above the normal value of 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. So if we have CO2 that's greater than 45 millimeters of mercury, we have hypercapnic respiratory failure, and it causes acidosis unless it's a chronic situation in which the body has time to equilibrate and increase the, um, the pH by increasing the amount of bicarb in the kidneys. So anyways, we have respiratory acidosis if we have a CO2 that's greater than 45, and that occurs because something is interfering with this process of excretion at one of these levels. And we have a pH that's less than the normal values of 7.35 to 7.45. So I kind of think of three major classifications uh, that of causes for respiratory acidosis. And one is the person won't breathe. And won't breathe is something, it's not always a conscious decision. In fact, it's usually not a conscious decision, but it's being, it's being controlled by the brain. So people won't breathe because typically because they're sedated or they have some kind of serious um, neurological problem that's interfering with brain stem function. So the most common cause would be sedation. And narcotics are the main player but also any other sedative medications. The second major cause you can think of as can't breathe. And this category, in terms of people can't breathe because there's some kind of neuromuscular problem. So there's some kind of problem with the neuromuscular status of the chest and the chest wall or the diaphragm. And this can occur because of issues with the peripheral nervous system, such as Guillain-Barre or myasthenia gravis. Um, and then the final status is related to what's going on in the lower airway of the lung itself. And we can consider that can't breathe enough. And the most common causes of this are people who have chronic respiratory disease and like COPD, asthma. And these can occur acutely if there is a serious drop in pulmonary reserve. And this can happen, you know, if you have a patient with COPD who may not have chronic retention of CO2, but then they have an exacerbation where they get an upper airway infection 
and that just sort of tips them over the edge. So they have low, very low pulmonary reserve, and as soon as they get just that sort of second hit of uh, a bronchitis, then they're not able to breathe enough. Now, very briefly, I want to talk about the, the main problem with increased CO2 levels is that it's toxic to the brain. And so major signs of serious acute hypercapnic respiratory failure is that there are acute changes in mental status. So, you know, if you have a patient that has lethargy, sometimes it can, it can progress to where a patient has myoclonus or even can have seizures when CO2 levels become very high. So if you have a patient that has unexplained respiratory failure and you're suspecting that it may be respiratory acidosis, it's always a good idea to check an ABG and check the CO2 levels. So when you're treating respiratory acidosis, it's best to remember first the ABCs. So airway, breathing, circulation. So if you have a patient who has respiratory acidosis and has related mental status changes, typically this happens in severe CO2 retention where you have PaCO2 that is greater than 75 or 80 or so millimeters of mercury. When that occurs and you're seeing mental status changes, then it's probably a situation where you need to intubate the patient and ventilate for them because they're not able to breathe enough. So once you have, once you've taken care of the ABCs, the treatment for respiratory acidosis is to treat the underlying cause. So, you know, you need to get a good history, physical labs, imaging, chest imaging, CT or, or x-ray. Um, you know, if, if they don't have anything that explains their increased CO2 levels based on their immediate history, you may want to do a tox screen. For chronic CO2 retention, in a patient that doesn't have lung disorders, it may be worth checking a thyroid function test and also brain imaging as well if there's issues with the brain stem that could be causing abnormal decreases in ventilation. Okay, before we finish up, there's one other concept that I want to discuss, and that's distinguishing between acute respiratory acidosis and chronic respiratory acidosis. This decision is made based on whether it, there is compensation, it's a compensated respiratory acidosis, or uncompensated. So what does compensated mean? Compensated means that we have a case where we have an increased CO2, so we have a CO2 that is greater than normal, so greater than 45, and we have a pH that is right around 7.35, the bottom end of normal. That means that it is compensated. Now, the body never overcompensates, so you're never going to see a patient that has respiratory, uh, respiratory acidosis that has a pH of 7.45. It's never going to be higher than it needs to be. It's always going to be right around 7.35. So this means that over time, the kidneys have responded to this increase of acidity in the blood because of the CO2 by increasing the amount of bicarbonate. So you'll have increased bicarbonate levels and that will help to balance out the increase in CO2 that's causing acidosis and give us a pH of right around 7.35. So an acute situation is when you have hypercapnia, CO2 greater than 7.45, but our pH remains significantly less than 7.35. If you have a patient that has a pH that equals 7.35 and a PaCO2 of 55, so that's high, and you've got a bicarb that is also high, then this is what a compensated 
respiratory acidosis would look like. We know that it's a respiratory acidosis because we've got a high CO2 and a low normal pH and typically an elevated bicarb. So this kind of situation where the pH is normalized in spite of an elevated CO2 suggests that this is compensated, which means that it's been going on for at least three or four days. And so we have either a chronic or a subacute situation. It's not acute. And that's it for our lesson today. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to please like and subscribe below.